Hi, my name is Mike Furlow. I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Scholarly Communications at Penn State University Libraries. I've been asked by the editors of the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication to speak with you for a few minutes about how I do my job, what scholarly communications means, and uh, how that meaning is, uh, is inflected in my role as, uh, as a librarian and uh, perhaps throughout our profession. So the first thing I want to say is this phrase, this term, scholarly communications, means very little to most people. Uh, it's a term of art for librarians, but if you walk down the street, talk to your family during the holidays, or talk to your colleagues in the teaching uh, faculty at your college or university, they're going to blink at you when you use that phrase. We know in our own profession it's come to mean, or come to be associated with several different kinds of, of, uh, of things, uh, including the uh, movement for open access and advocacy for open access, it, uh, for a period of time, was strongly associated with issues of serial inflation and journal inflation. Um, and more generally, I think we've used it as a term to mean change, change in the profession, change in the way research is conducted, but change, change, and more change without necessarily being always that clear about what that change might mean. So, for me, I use, when I'm talking with folks, I define scholarly communications as the system we use to make research and scholarship public. Now, Paul Courant has a great blog post from a few years ago called uh, Why I Hate the Term Scholarly Communications. And in that blog post, he points out that the, uh, we used to use the phrase publishing or the term publishing to refer to much of what we accomplished with scholarly communication now. But in fact, we know that uh, publishing does not begin to define the number of different activities that now we are engaging in, which I take part in, and, and push for in my work. Um, for me, publishing is very much a continuum. It exists along um, a, a wide range of activity. It encompasses the book that you write in the humanities or the journal article you publish in Nature or in Science, but it could also encompass this video, which I'm recording this afternoon, or even the notes I've used to prepare this, uh, this, this recording. What happens if I want to make this those notes accessible? What happens if the journal decides not to run this video and I want to make it accessible in some other ways? That's that informal side of scholarly communication and that's the one that I've found myself spending more time thinking about. Um, I think the role of the library is to think about the ways in which the system as it exists now does not necessarily serve our users well. And those users are uh, come in different uh, 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 types. So, for example, those users might be investigators who are seeking information. Those are the users that we, libra we as librarians have classically um, concerned ourselves with, the people who walk in the door or come to our website. But scholarly communication activities in the past decade have really focused on users as authors who are distributing information, and that has been uh, a large part of the premise behind institutional repositories. But there's also another, another way in which it's becoming important for us to think of our users, and that is as creators, uh, as researchers using information, analyzing information. And uh, that is an area of activity where libraries have yet to, um, have not, I shouldn't say yet to, but have not always been able to stake a claim, especially as uh, research has become more and more digitally driven. Now, I think there are some good examples of this. Uh, for example, in the digital humanities, many libraries have been working directly with faculty in English or history or uh, arts in order to gather, create, or store uh, original works and get them online. Um, they've helped by digitizing special collections materials uh, as well. So I think that's, that's one way in which uh, libraries have worked directly with researchers in the creation and use of information. We're also seeing it start to emerge now in the realm of what we're calling e-science uh, and research data management mandates. So when the NSF required that all researchers uh, proposing a, uh, a grant to their foundation uh, required them to all include a short two-page data management plan, libraries across the country really began to step up and say, okay, now what do we know about data management that we can help our community know, our, our researchers know more about? How can we ask them, what questions can we give them to think through the process of, of planning to create, organize, store, and archive data for however long that needs to be? So these are the questions that drive me 
as the Associate Dean for Research and Scholarly Communication, thinking about what programs we need to have in place in our libraries that will help our community take advantage of the modes of distribution, the modes of preservation that we are either we either now have at our disposal or which we are creating, uh, take advantage of those so that research can be shared in ways that it had not otherwise been shared. And if we think about it in those ways, we can serve our users in all three definitions. The user as the investigator seeking, as the author creating, and as the, uh, or rather as the author distributing, and as the creator analyzing and researching information. Um, the last thing I'll say here is that if we're going to do this effectively, we have to be thinking about different ways of building capacity. Uh, and I'm thinking about this both in terms of staffing and in terms of infrastructure. So for staffing, uh, we have um, a whole set of new activities in libraries we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to create, we're trying to build and develop. And this has often been an area where new librarians have come in from, uh, into the profession from either library school or other fields and begun to work. And it's very clear that when new librarians begin to work in fields like data curation, which are still emerging, the, it becomes clear to them and it's clear to me that the profession does not have good mechanisms for helping them network and connect with each other. There is not an organization that's solely devoted to that activity and existing professional organizations don't necessarily have the niche for that in their, in their, uh, in their makeup. So we see, uh, we see this need, we need to find ways of helping uh, emerging librarians, new librarians connect with others in their field, but also create networking opportunities for them with our colleagues in publishing or with researchers on campus. Now I'd say the same holds true even for more established librarians who we are our subject specialists who we are really expecting a lot of in the future. We're really expecting that our subject specialists will become more conversant with issues of research, scientific research, e-research, and ways of, of helping our, our, their faculty organize and preserve that information. We're not asking them to devise all those mechanisms, but we do want them to be conversant so that they can help direct research, researchers towards the services that we're trying to create here or elsewhere. And so I think what we are, we talk a lot about people needing training for e-research or for scientific data management. I think a lot of the times what we're talking about is exposure and networking. We need to find ways of creating in our libraries the means for, um, for our librarians in the subject specialties as well as in the technical specialties to learn more from each other and collaborate to create these services. The last uh, issue I want to talk about today is about capacity building in terms of infrastructure. And I want to share a thought that someone uh, had a couple of weeks ago at a conference I was at, and someone said that uh, we've been creating institutional solutions to disciplinary problems for a long time now. And in fact, that's what institutional repositories have been, institutional solutions to problems that are actually disciplinary based. We're not going to be able to create these same institutional solutions forever. We're going to have to find ways to work together to establish the infrastructure that we need in order to help our community develop and to help research flourish. Um, a very real question I have is why should every research library, every college run an institutional repository? Why should every organization run its own set of publishing services? The reason right now is because we don't really have a good mechanism for going out elsewhere to another library uh, or to very many vendors to provide those services for us. I think what we should be doing in our community is begin to ask ourselves the questions, what would it mean for us to collaborate and create shared infrastructure? What would it mean for the activities that I define as scholarly communication services to be supported by infrastructure that is shared and cooperatively managed by not only my library but other libraries that are similar to mine? Um, there are going to be some things that we'll have to continue to do locally but we'll have to find the ways of doing things we can do together or else we won't be able to meet the needs that we're seeing and we won't really be able to support scholarly communications however we choose to define it going forward. Thanks very much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this and I've enjoyed talking with you.